Welcome to the Lessons from Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Brian Beckham. Okay, well, I did not think that in 2021, the first week of 2021, we would literally have people dressed up like Vikings with animal horns in our nation's capital. What a bizarre, bizarre world we live in. I have a lot of thoughts about all this stuff and how we got to the place that we got to in this country. I'm sure like a lot of you, when I see on TV these people storming our capital, I just think to myself, what happened? These people have lost their fucking minds. This is ridiculous. How can people possibly believe that it would be a good idea to dress up with a Camp Auschwitz t-shirt or get weapons and zip ties or dress up in all this cosplay nonsense and storm our nation's capital? How could anybody possibly think that would be a good idea? Well, my next guest has some good explanations for that. I'm talking about Robin Hansen. Robin is an associate professor of economics at George Mason University, as well as a research associate at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University. He has physics degrees from the University of Chicago, and he worked for DARPA, as well as Lockheed and NASA. Professor Hansen has 4,510 citations of his work. He's published multiple books, including a book called Elephant in the Brain, Hidden Motives in Everyday Life, a book that I read a couple years ago that changed the way I saw the world. Professor Hansen's book basically demonstrates that in all different walks of life, religion, politics, art, you name it, sports, we behave in ways that we don't even realize fundamentally why we are behaving in those ways. We fool ourselves all the time. So I thought Robin would be a perfect guest, given the circumstances we find ourselves in as a country. In the podcast, Robin and I talk about how our minds actually work, how we deceive ourselves and others, why we deceive ourselves, what the incentives are behind deceiving ourselves. We talk about some other topics as well. Robin is very interested in a broad array of topics, including how to have better conversations how to be less disagreeable. He's got some thoughts on cryonics and consciousness. Robin has signed up to have his brain frozen when he dies. And we talk about aliens and Robin's belief that we for sure will ultimately come in contact with alien civilizations and why he thinks that. This is a perfectly timed podcast. I shot it and released it as fast as I could because I think Robin has a lot to say that gives some structure and some explanation for why our country has turned into a bunch of raving lunatics when it comes to politics, or or at least what we, many of us would perceive as raving lunatics. Now I give you Professor Robin Hanson. Hey everybody, Brian Beckham here, and I have got Robin Hansen. And I got to tell everybody, I am so fired up about this episode. <laughs> I, it's hard to overstate. Robin and I have a lot of the same interests. We, we have a lot of interest in a lot of different things. The problem we're going to have, I can tell already in this podcast, is we have so many things we're interested that we'd like to talk about that we're not going to be able to get to all of them. So, But, but we're shooting this podcast uh, a few days after the siege or assault of the Capitol Robin uh, has has some thoughts about, uh, and he's actually written a book called The Elephant in the Brain, which I talk about in the introduction, that that, uh, tries to explain, and Robin, I don't want to misstate the book, but but to my mind, your book is an effort to explain how people act on motives that they often don't even know themselves they are acting upon. And so I want to relate that, if we can, Robin, to kind of the craziness uh, of the public uh, uh, sphere, the political sphere that we're seeing right now. Before we get into that, and I also want to talk to you a little bit about, you've got some really cool thoughts about aliens and the great filter. You've got some ideas about legal reforms. I mean, it's just the ideas you have are, are unbelievable. But before we get into that, there will be a lot of people listening to this podcast who know exactly who Robin Hansen are, but there will be some people who don't. So give us a just like a, a brief biography, who you are, where you came from, and how you ended up where you are today. All right. Well, I'm an economics professor. 
but I've been tenured for a while, so I don't have to focus on economics. Uh, the nice thing about tenure is you can do whatever you want. And I'm one of those people who was pretty inclined to study a wide range of topics. So I had to make myself focus a while so that I could get tenure. And I just squeaked by luckily, but tenure is a great deal. I'm now 61 years old. So I've been around a while and I've been across a lot of different fields in my life and I had a lot of different moves. One of the most dramatic moves I made was at the age of 34 with two kids age zero and two, I returned from my career as a research programmer to graduate school to get a PhD in social science at Caltech. And from then I got a postdoc and then the job I have now, which eventually got tenure. So uh, I'm really just interested in a wide range of topics, uh, but I try to hold myself to the standard of if I'm going to go into a new topic, I should stay with it long enough to make a contribution make Good. something that's an actual substantial thing that we add to what the world knows otherwise it's just dilettante and you know goofing around and it's not valuable so i think i'm i can meet that standard on most of the topics i've gone into i've added something you've got uh two degrees in physics and then uh, a social science uh, phd that that's an interesting combination you, you and i uh, share that in common i have an under undergraduate degree in engineering computer science plus philosophy and then a law degree what and, and you did some work for darpa for the future map program did some work for lockheed martin before you went into the academy tell us right. a little bit about how you went from studying physics working for darpa lockheed martin into what you're doing today well, it's a long history, so there's a lot of things to say that I don't want to take all the time here with, but I guess I'll, I'll riff on some key points. Um, when I was a physics undergraduate, I remember sort of standing in the elevator next to some other physics professors. I wasn't talking to them, I was just listening, and they were talking to each other about how if only they would bother, they could go over to those social science buildings across campus and straighten them all out, because obviously that was all bullshit, and obviously those people just didn't know how to think, and so physicists yeah. knew how to think. So coming from a hard science or engineering background stem sort of thing those people tend to be taught that social science is bullshit. <laughs> it's just it doesn't make sense there's no content there it's all just made up fluff yeah and they're pretty arrogant about that and they're wrong <laughs> the social scientists are often wrong but it's not bullshit it's it's um, there's a lot of knowledge there but it's it's a harder subject and in some sense the main reason it's harder is that people care yeah. Uh, in physics, people actually hardly anyone fundamentally cares emotionally about physics in terms of one theory being true or another, but they care a lot about social science. So that means social scientists have to do a lot more resisting all the temptation to believe what you want to believe or what somebody else pushes you to believe. And that's what makes social science hard. Um, but I think a, a great advantage of coming from physics is the expectation that there will be some simple answers. <laughs> simple enough to understand and yet powerful enough to explain a lot of things. Some people who only ever grew up in social science, they just have this sense, well, it's all in, you know, in, intractably complicated and you can never really figure anything out except maybe a glimpse from a distance. And it's all sort of all swirled up and mixed up with your own priors and emotions and politics and everything. And so, you know, they, they don't really expect to get a clear answer and to get strong evidence and to wait for strong evidence. So I think I think my physics background leads me to expect to wait for clearer answers, to expect to have, be able to prove things to a wider range of people in a wider range of contexts. And uh, I think that's served me well because if you look for them, they are there. You know, I remember when I was studying computer science, I took an economics class and I it, this was back in the early nineties. And I remember thinking this is before Behavioral economists, uh, e economics became a big thing. This was kind of more classical economics about the rational man and the rational actor. And I remember having this intuition, Robin. I couldn't put it in words, but as an engineer and a philosopher, I had this intuition that the entire foundation of classical economics was based on bullshit. Like there is no rational actor. People don't act rationally. And that always kind of bothered me. And like, like I said, at the time, uh, Kahneman and cognitive biases and all, all these things that have become a big deal lately, behavioral economics, were not really that big a thing. So talk to us a little bit about that issue. Like, in other words, okay, so you've done a lot of, yeah, you've done a lot of work on how classical economics kind of tried to make things real clean and economics turns out to be much more messy than the. So let's talk 
talk about yeah. physics for a moment. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah. physical world is obviously enormously complicated. Yeah. And obviously, almost anything around you, like the elephant standing behind you, according to what I see here, <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> is enormously complicated. <laughs> and so, the way we can only ever reason about anything in the physical world is through simplifications and simplified models, which we know to be false because uh, the world isn't that simple. But quite often, simplified models are quite productive and help us think about things. So. Uh, almost all theoretical reasoning in any fields is a trade-off in practice between you know, getting it exactly right and getting it simple enough so you can reason about it and do something with it. And that's true in every field, not just economics or physics, but every field whatsoever. Uh, and so I think people get too hung up on the, you know, the simplification and say, but the simplification isn't true, but it's never true. <laughs> you yeah. know. Uh, you know, a, if you model a planet as a sphere, that's pretty good. Modeling a person as a sphere, not so good. But we often model people as spheres. Yeah. yeah. When, when we're doing something quick and dirty, uh, and you know, and as you know, in computer science, even you know, most programs are really complicated, but we still make models of simple parts of programs, and that gives us some insights, even if the programs themselves are far more complicated than these models. And so, I would say, in fact, behavioral economics doesn't actually change economics that much. You know, if you believe that, ah, they were all wrong before, but now they've got behavioral, so, you know, they must be fixed at their problems. Well, no, behavioral economics really doesn't change that much. So what you really do need some structure to cut through all the vast possibilities, some simplifying structure, and the rationality assumption is actually not crazy as a simplifying assumption for a lot of things. That is, you know, one of the slight variations on the simple rationality model is people do the rational problem profit or utility maximizing thing plus noise. Yeah. So honestly, in almost every field of science, one of the standard things you do with an oversimplified model is add noise. You say, our model predicts this plus noise, and then you can fit it to data and you can you know, get a chance of how well it fits. You almost never have any model without noise because that never works. <laughs> That's yeah. completely wrong. But models with noise are actually often pretty good, even if they're pretty simple models with noise. So economists model of rational people plus noise actually does a pretty good job in a wide range of scenarios um, now but but re relevant to my book the key thing is rationality is about achieving particular ends what are the ends so the claim in our book the elephant in the brain my, which i co-author with a wonderful co-author kevin similar is that the way economists and other social scientists have often gone wrong is right at the beginning and making the wrong assumptions about what the end is, what the purpose of it is, what are the motives? Yeah, that's where we go wrong. But once we offer a new assumption about the motives, we're still going to offer a pretty simple model of the motives and assume some sort of basic rationality in achieving those motives. And we're going to understand a lot of things in the world. So we're not rejecting rationality. Mostly we're rejecting your assumption about what your ends are, what, what your goals are. And I don't want to get into it to any kind of tautological reasoning, but sometimes, like you say in your book, it's rational to be irrational, or it's it's rational to be perceived to be thinking irrationally. Right, so right up at the beginning, when you're explaining human behavior, you need to make a distinction between proximate and distal causes. Everything in the universe that's caused has a, an immediate cause, the closest thing to that thing very nearby in space and time that caused it. And then there are other causes farther away. I mean, the reason why you're hot at the moment might be that uh, the heat is on or something, but behind that, there's why the heat's turned on, that you're on a planet with the sun nearby. All those are more distal causes that contribute to the, your current temperature at the moment. So anytime we're talking about causes, we have to think about what level or distance from the phenomena we're talking about. So. In our book, Elephant in the Brain, we're mostly talking about pretty distant causes, and that's a thing to be clear about. So the reason why you do something right now is probably in the next moment you eat a bite of a cookie or something. It's probably pretty <laughs> related to thoughts you had a few moments ago about, do I want to eat this cookie? I guess I do. And you start chomping. And so, you know, often your stories about what you're doing at that moment have a sensible relationship to uh, the thing you do the moment later. Uh, we're, so we're not so much questioning that kind of connection between your actions. We're, we're questioning more farther back in the more distant explanations. Well, why did you eat the cookie? Yeah. Or why did you go to the protest? Or why did you, you know, have the conversation? And so the farther back you go, the more you're not really paying attention to whether the explanation is correct, because you usually just make some assumptions and assume they're right. 
Yeah. And that's the place where you are the most wrong. How far, how far does that go? Like how, how far back do you treat, do, do you, do you uh, look for people's intentions? So for, for instance, you have uh, chapters on art, you have chapters on politics, you have chapters on religion, you have chapters on a lot of different, where, where you give specific examples of people thinking they have one intention, but in, in, in actuality have much deeper incentives or intentions. So how, how, how far back do you go on that, Robin? Well, um, fundamentally, humans are a biological species <laughs> who uh, exist on Earth, and we have some distinguishing features from other species, and we have some characteristic behaviors that we tend to do that other species don't. And those characteristic behaviors were to be understood in terms of some evolutionary process that uh, honed our species to be a certain kind of species with a certain lifestyle and a certain pattern of the kinds of things we eat and when we go to sleep, etc. And that's sort of the typical place where you might want to ground an explanation for human behavior and say, you know, why do we have sex? Well, sex produced children and, you know, it's good for a species to make children. And you might think, well, you know, in your head at the moment while you have sex, it's, it's about your pleasure and, and, and uh, what you hope to experience in the next few minutes. But fundamentally evolutionary explanation is uh, evolution had to find a way to get you to do that to produce a next generation. So in our book, we're more focused on these more distant explanations, just why is there any payoff or reinforcement of doing that sort of thing? What is the payoff or reinforcement process that tended to produce creatures who have a habit of doing that sort of thing, uh, even if they don't know exactly why? How much do how much of this, how much of our behavior do you think is determined? How, like, is this a, de- are you a determinist? Do you think everything is predetermined? Do you believe man, I, I hesitate to open this door, but how much free will do you think we actually have? Uh, so uh, I, I think when people use the words free will or, or phrases like that, they, they mean a wide range of different things. And sometimes, you know, if they want to make a philosophy argument, go to some extreme, they pick some, you know, particular definition, but that's not necessarily the definition other people have in mind. Yeah. So I mean, the, the two obvious definitions that make sense are, one is a very subjective definition, could I eat the cookie if I, could I choose to pick up my hand and eat the cookie if I wanted to, yeah. unless something's holding my hand down or some unusual circumstance, then I have the free will to pick the cookie as there's a correlation between my perception about what I wanted to do, I eat the cookie and what actually happens, I eat the cookie, right? Now, there's this larger philosophical perception, perspective from which you might say, ah, but what if there was a common cause behind your wanting to eat the cookie and then you're eating the cookie? then you, that might have determined those things and you didn't really have the free will not to eat the cookie or to want to eat the cookie because something determined that. And I, you know, by physics. So physics basically says it's all deterministic. It's all completely deterministic well, at a or, fundamental or, level. So maybe, I, I buy that. Yeah, maybe deterministic plus chaos. No, no, not even I plus chaos. It's really just fundamentally deterministic. So our, our best theories in the universe say it's all actually completely deterministic. And I buy those series. And so, but that's not in contradiction with my perception that I can eat the cookie or not. <laughs> because yeah. usually when I ask, can I do what I want? I don't really care where, what the cause of what I want was. Yeah. I take what I want as given and I ask, can I do what I want? Uh, I think it's completely reasonable to think that you might be a creature where there was a process that caused your wants. Your wants didn't float out from some ethereal other place than the universe. You're in the universe. Your causes are in the universe and your I mean, your wants are in the universe and your wants were caused by other things. Well, let's talk now about uh, a little bit more about your book. So everybody, the, the book again is The Elephant in the Brain. I read this book. I was talking to Robin before the, we went on the air. I read this book a couple of years ago. I read tons of books every year and my favorite books I always make notes on. And I went, I had a lot of notes on your book, Robin. I went back and looked at them. And I think your book, but basically my, my, uh, my notes, uh, at the very beginning say that the major point in your book is essentially we act on hidden motives all the time in public, just like we act on hidden, uh, hidden motives in private when we deceive ourselves. So that's kind of how I summarized the book to me, but what, what I'd like to do, Robin, given the current state of affairs is I'd like to talk about your book, some of the specific examples of how we deceive ourselves and others. And then I want to get your thoughts on 
how this applies to what is going on politically right now, all this craziness. I mean, who would have thought there would be an antler wearing half naked bearded face painted man sitting on Nancy Pelosi's desk a, a, a week or so ago. There's something going on that we really, I think, uh, need to figure out and get to the bottom of. And so, so let's I guess talk although, about if, if you read a little history, stranger things really have happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's really not anywhere close to the peak of strangeness of human behavior in history. Yeah. Fair, <laughs> fair, fair, certainly fair, stands out to you. fair point, but T tell us a little bit. So, so, so the, so the, the, key the basic point here, idea behind the book. Yeah, what's the main thrust of your book? So, I'm an economist, and we economists tend to make the mistake of taking people at their word for why they do things. And so, we yeah. give elaborate theories, but we we make that fundamental mistake. And over a career, I've realized that that seems to be the fundamental mistake. And so, it's late in my career that I started to write books. I've only written two. I've written books that like I've been wanting to write for a long time because I thought were important. So. This I thought was important. So the, the key point is that we are very social creatures, we humans. We humans uh, evolved as very social creatures. And so the main environment that mattered for us was the people around us. And it was really important that they think well of us and not think badly of us. And humans have norms, that is rules about what you're supposed to do and not supposed to do. And so one of the most important things that happens to us is that we might get accused of violating a norm. And in that case, we wanna be ready to defend ourselves to say um, that we aren't violating a norm. And that's overwhelmingly important. So important that your conscious mind is not really the president or king of your mind, it's the press secretary. Its job is mainly to keep track of what you're doing and always have a story about why what you're doing was okay and not violating norms. That's your job. <laughs> yeah. you, you, your conscious mind that's your job. You think you're running things, but you're not. You're the press secretary. So that's that's why that's so important. So that means you don't know why you actually do things. What you know is a good story about why you do things that you can defend yourself with against norm violations. Now, an, an essential element of a lot of norms is intention. So if I accidentally hit you, that's a lot more okay than if I hit you on purpose. So what I intended in hitting you matters a lot. Well, that's why your motives matter a lot. That's why your conscious mind is not only looking at what you're doing and asking, you know, what, why was my arm anywhere near your face? It's asking, what were my motives? And so I would need to be very ready all the time to tell you what my motive in doing any particular thing is to justify that I didn't have the wrong motives that violated the norms. So this is why you don't know your motives <laughs> because yeah. you aren't choosing most of your actions. You're explaining them or justifying them. And you're looking for good looking motives, good enough looking motives that will you know, take away the accusations. So that's the key story here about why you don't know your motives. Now, yeah. in principle, that story could be consistent with people who are usually right, but just wrong every once in a while. And so when we look out in the world, we do usually know that people are sometimes wrong about why they do things. It's a common knowledge thing about human behavior. Sometimes people are self-deceived, right? Sure. Uh, sometimes people are in denial, right? Be, you might be in denial about whether your spouse is having an affair. So you kind of know, you see the clues, but you look away, for example. That could be, you know, something that's going on. So we know that's a thing that happens for people. The question is, how often does it happen? And of course, does it happen for you? And so our main message isn't the, just that it's possible sometimes that you might be self-deceived and wrong about your motives. Our main story is going to be you're self-deceived and wrong about your motives a lot. Yeah. <laughs> all through your lives. Now, the only way to really convince you of that is to go through area by area, one at a time and say, let's look at this area. This is what you say, why you're doing it. And let's look at some other possible theories. And so the general structure of our book after the first third where we go through the, the, the abstract theory about why this could make some sense is to go through 10 areas of life and say in each one, what's our standard story about why we're doing this? What are some puzzles that don't make that much sense from the point of view of that standard theory and what's an alternative theory that makes more sense of these puzzles. And for each one, we come up with a different motive that makes sense of the puzzles and does make sense as something people might do. And we hope that with 10 of those areas, you'll start to believe that maybe you were wrong about a lot of things, not just a couple. <laughs> of things. You know, one thing that, uh, that I, so, so I've done a lot of work on uh, cognitive bias, a lot of reading, a lot of study. Uh, and I got to the point, Robin, earlier this year where I felt like I was 
essentially impervious. And I, I recognize that, that I was subject to cognitive biases, but I felt as if, and, and, and you know, I recognize also that there, no matter what I did, I would yeah, have- Yeah, that's bias. kind of the problem with that literature. Yeah. <laughs> and, the main and, ways people use it is to try to convince themselves that it's not a problem for them. Because and that's exactly and that's exactly what I was about to say. So, so I got to the point where I was like, okay, I have cognitive biases. I know I have cognitive biases. I can, I can correct and do certain things to check those cognitive biases. And then I remembered, because I read this somewhere a month or so ago, that kind of the meta point that Kahneman and Tversky make in that book is the people that think that they can uh, uh, take care of their cognitive biases or be, be more aware of their cognitive biases almost always overestimate their ability to do that, right? So no matter how well informed you are, no matter how well right. you know about this stuff, it almost doesn't matter, right? Well, it, it makes some differences, but not the difference you wanted. So right. humans have this ancient habit of disagreeing with each other. <laughs> and all through you know, the last million years of human history, when somebody disagrees with you, what we usually do is try to identify some theory of how they're wrong. Yeah. And our story of them being wrong usually has some version of a mental mistake they made or a tendency of mistakes they made that they're unaware of. And that is in fact, our usual way of making sense of disagreement. We say, well, I'm right and they're wrong, but they have screwed up somehow and it could have been one of these mess ups. So in that sense, people have long been aware of the concept of bias or the concept of mental mistakes and they have invoked it systematically in their lives to explain other people. <laughs> And they're happy with being able to eat more easily see other people's mistakes than their own because that lets them continue to decide I'm right and they're wrong and I don't need to change my mind when I hear someone disagree with me. So the problem is, of course, you're wrong on average as much as they are. Exactly. And so uh, you need to think about different approaches to figure out who's right or wrong. So we can go down like how to handle disagreement if you like later on. But I think first you wanna like sort of get to the core basic theory here and you wanted to talk about recent political events. Yeah, so talk about, so you have a chapter on politics and you talk about hidden motives in people's political behavior. Talk about that chapter a little bit and then apply the analysis to what we see going on Okay, right so now. For, first I have to say, some areas of life, we all sort of do the same things. And in other areas of life, we do different things. And so when we do different things, we're more aware of the of the fact that we do different things and we're more eager to explain other people's differences via their mistakes. And so hidden motives is one class of mistakes. So in areas where we do different things and have conflicts, we are quite ready to open, open to the idea that other people are making mistakes and other people are biased and other people have hidden motives. And that's gonna be the case in politics. Politics is obviously an area where we have conflicts. And so the other side is gonna be a plausible candidate to us of people who are falling for biases and mistakes and who have motives that they aren't aware of because we're happy to attribute the other side to their terrible mistakes and motives. Whereas for our side, we don't think that needs to be invoked because you know we're doing the reasonable thing and they're doing the unreasonable thing. Now, in other areas of life, like say medicine, we all do kind of the same thing. And this makes us much more blind to our hidden motives there because we can all be following a hidden motive that we're denying it and then not really notice it because we don't see people doing the different thing. <laughs> yeah. So for example, in medicine, we say, the usual thing we say is we go to the doctor or the hospital to get well, that is we get sick and they can make us well and that's why we go. And since we all say that and we all wanna support everybody else for saying that, we don't question it very much. What if that's not why we go? And so in the book we say, actually why you go to the doctor is to show that you care about other people and let them show they care about you which isn't a terrible thing, but it's not the thing you admit and talk about. So, but you're really blind to that. And it'll take a bit to convince you on this podcast if you've probably just heard the last few seconds and said, what, Hanson's crazy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because that sounds crazy. I've read the book and I was thinking, <laughs> man, that sounds crazy. <laughs> right, yeah. but uh, because you're gonna, so in politics, you're gonna be more open to the idea, at least some other people have hidden motives and that's why you have to be careful here to be too eager to jump on the other people instead of yourself. But so let's walk through politics. Politics, we say, why do you do politics? So if you ask people why they're involved in politics, the easy answer they will give is they're trying to help yeah. their nation or their city or their world. 
uh, you know, they could just ignore politics and go about their lives, but they are altruistic, caring people who are willing to put a little time and energy into helping the world through their political action. That's the simple story. And that's the story most people would want to tell about politics. Um, but there's a number of puzzles that don't fit so well with that story. And just like in all the other chapters, we have the puzzles. So we want to walk through the puzzles that don't fit so well with the simple story in politics. Now, obviously, one thing is people are pretty gullible about politics. <laughs> if you, yeah. you know, try to sell them a crappy used car, they're going to look at that askance and, and perhaps, you know, not buy it. But in politics, they lower their standards often and they're willing to believe a lot of pretty tenuous, loose reasoning, et cetera. Yeah. They're often pretty emotional about it. People care a lot about the politics of people they're associated with. So, you know, many, just a survey I saw recently saying, you know, a large fraction of parents would be disappointed if their child married someone from the other political party or even had a really romantic relationship with somebody from the other political party. Interesting. Uh, so people have enormous, you know, caring and concern about having people around them share their politics. Um, politicians mostly have to take positions. Now, you know, politicians like work behind the scenes, they craft deals, they make compromises, they can work the system and voters almost care almost nothing about that. <laughs> they don't reward politicians for being good behind the scenes and making things happen. They just want to know what positions they've taken, even on positions on topics they can't do anything about. So like in the United States, the president can't do much about education, but you know what? Everybody cares about the president's position on education or presidential candidate's position on education. And uh, another puzzling thing about politics is that uh, there's a remarkable correlation across topics. So, uh, you know, there are thousands of political and policy dimensions in the world, and yet you can explain a large fraction of the variation in those opinions by just one dimension of political position, left versus right. Yeah. But why should there be this one dimension that explains so much variation in politics? That's kind of crazy because it's just a big, complicated world. Uh, and so, We'd say uh, in, in the book that you are sort of being a Dudley do-right in politics. That's your pretense. I am a Dudley do-right. I go out and make the world better. And we're saying, what's well, you're actually a little closer to what we'd call an apparatchik. That's a name for an old Soviet politician yep. who, worked, who worked the system. A bureaucrat, so, right? A yeah, bureaucrat, well, like not a, just a bureaucrat, but a faithful political loyalist yeah. who you know supports the party. So. There's an old story about how there was a meeting and they were discussing many things. And then at one point, the name of Stalin came up and he was alive at the time and important. And everybody was eager to show yay Stalin. So they all stood up and started clapping, yay Stalin. He's not in the room, but they're clapping for Stalin. They keep clapping for 10 minutes. And of course, near the end, people wonder, is it time to stop clapping for Stalin? <laughs> and of course, they each think, well, I don't want to be the first one to sit down and stop clapping for Stalin because that'll yeah. make me less loyal than the other guys. So yeah. one person was the first person to sit down and stop clapping. Then the rest of them go, I can sit down and stop clapping. And of course, that night, that guy went to Siberia. Yep. Yeah. I think there's actually, I, I went back, I, you know, people have constantly are citing, talking about things being Orwellian and blah, blah, blah. I actually went back and read 1984 a couple months ago. I think there's a scene in 1984 about exactly what you're describing. They're, they're having some sort of political rally and they're literally, the leaders are scanning the crowd to see who is not clapping and, and celebrating. Wrongly enough. Yeah. Wrongly enough. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's the key idea that in politics, what your main motivation, even if you're not aware of it, is to show loyalty to your allies, to yeah. your sides. Your tribe. So now you may have multiple tribes that overlap that you're part of, but for each one, you're trying to show loyalty. Yeah. And that means uh, you're not that rational about it. You're a bit irrational about your loyalty because even if your side believes something that doesn't quite make sense, it, it's more important for you to show loyalty to your, to your side than to try to like help your side make more sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're fine. Well, you know, this thing we've been saying, that doesn't make so much sense. How about we switch to that? That doesn't sound a little so loyal, uh, even though, of course, you're actually helping your side. And so you're more eager to just you know, my country right or wrong, take your side. And so that explains a lot of these puzzles in politics, explains why we care so much about the people around us sharing our political views, why we get emotional, why we're not very careful about analyzing these things, uh, explains why there's this one dimension spectrum in politics. Uh, and, you know, that's the story here. So that means we are not very careful and reasonable in politics. It might, my 
ex-coblogger once called this said the phrase politics is the mind killer which is evoking a phrase from the dune novels yep great As, uh, great you know, great novels some of, my, some of my favorite books of all time right and so that means all of us don't are sort of lose our minds a bit when we talk about politics. Now, there's other topics we also lose our minds about. It's not just politics, but we all say lose our mind a bit about romance, yeah. for example. Yeah, sure. It's a little crazy there, but sure. you know, we, we aren't in as much conflict there. So we don't sports, people pick on lose other their mind about, about sports. Yeah. Right. But in politics, there's the clear opponents. And so we're more willing to notice that they've lost their mind and pointed out. Yeah. <laughs> let, let me ask you, let me ask you this question. Let me see if you've experienced this phenomena. So I've experienced this phenomena mainly on social media and online. I'll see people who I know personally, who I spend time with, who who uh, our kids play sports together or go to school together. I know these people are tremendous, nice, compassionate, reasonable people. And then I go on social media and I look at it and I go, that person's fucking insane. Now, the funny thing about that is those people are going, man, I know Beckham. I know him personally. He's compassionate. He's nice. He's a friendly guy. But on Facebook, Beckham is fucking insane. So they think the same thing about me as I think about them. But the question I have for you, Robin, is why is it, do you think, that when you you and I are interacting like we are now, or even better face-to-face over a cup of coffee or lunch or something, we behave one way, and then we go online and we feel like we have license to behave in a completely different way. Like, wh- where does that dichotomy come from? Uh, so your- the first thing to notice is we are all very complicated creatures, and we are certainly smart enough to make our behavior depend on context. Yeah. So it, it doesn't make sense to always act the same way in all contexts because different contexts have different payoffs and different incentives, and so you should change your behavior with context. That's an issue, however, Um, we are wary of doing it for the reason that it actually helps to have an identity that we project to people. So we want other people around us to think they can understand us and predict what we do. That's important to us because otherwise, if if we're just a huge, complicated, random thing that does random things in situations, they can't rely on us and they can't, you know, put us in sensitive roles. So in order to convince the people around us that they can rely on us and, and trust us, we have to simplify ourselves. We have to take this vast variety potential that we have and squash it down to a smaller space so that we can show the people around us, hey, you can trust me. Now, if that dependence, of course, is the same way everybody's dependent, well, that's okay. So if I'm, you know, reasonable when I'm cooking and crazy about politics, you are too, and everybody around us is, well, that doesn't make me harder to predict because I'm, I'm very predictable. I'm following the same, you know, way in which my behavior depends on context of all the other people. So... We, we need to be predictable. That doesn't mean we have to be the same in each context as long as the way we change with context is very predictable. Yeah. So uh, now the key thing is we don't notice this so much about ourselves. We're, we're more able to notice it about other people. But, you know, depending on the topic I could bring up right now, you your reasonableness would change dramatically and so would mine, but I wouldn't notice it at the time. Yeah. And so I would remember have a moment ago feeling reasonable of myself. And at that point, I would feel reasonable about myself. And so this is our key blind spot. As soon as we go into these other more sensitive topics, we're usually not aware of how we're switching modes. We are changing the standards we apply and how careful we are and how attentive we are to being loyal. But we don't feel it. What do we what do we do about so so offer some prescriptions if you if you would about so when I look at these people that storm the Capitol for instance especially the people that were dressed up in this weird cosplay stuff that they you know the different uniforms and animal outfits and stuff like that when I look at these people I think they've lost their minds they've completely lost their minds what do we do first of all do you do you agree with that or is it a little bit deeper than that and second of all What do we do about it, Robin? Again, you know, we're much more critical of the other side in politics than our own side. And so, um, you know, I think you should just be careful about presuming, you know, who's more crazy than you about politics. For sure. (laughs) For sure. uh, It's really hard to judge your own craziness. And of course, you should expect a lot of craziness. And of course, we're telling you there's a lot of craziness, just not just about areas where you know about some. There's a lot of craziness about same medicine where you don't feel crazy and you don't think anybody's crazy. Yeah. But I'm telling you, but you are. You're still crazy. Yeah. 
even there, in the sense that what you're doing doesn't fit with what you say you do. What what you're doing make, is a thing that makes sense to do. So I might even say, you know, what if people are wearing funny costumes in a protest, that can make complete sense as a way to show loyalty to their associates. Yeah, uh, it's a functional thing. Uh, it's not crazy. <laughs> It's yeah. deviant from what you might expect, and it doesn't show loyalty to you, and you don't feel very tied to them, but they may well be succeeding in, in producing more ties so, so, with others. So maybe one way to put it, Robin, would be, you know, what's the difference between the guy and the horns and the antlers and the face paint at the Capitol and the guy at the football stadium who's got his shirt off when it's 28 degrees and yeah. he's got his team there, and he's, you know, looks like an incredibly sure. same person. But I'll tell you what, if he's – rooting for the same team we are, we're going to go, man, that guy is awesome. I love that guy. Right? What a fan, you say. What a fan. So kind of the same thing, maybe politically. The, I'll bet you the people that right. believe so, in this capital attack are looking at those folks going, man, that's awesome. Look I wish that. I had the courage to do that. I wish exactly. I thought of that first. Sure. Yeah. I mean, a lot yeah. depends on whether you think they're helping or hurting, of course. Which, so whether you praise them or criticize them. Now, so our book is primarily about telling you how the world is different than you thought. Yeah. Its focus is not how to fix the world or even how to fix your world. It's about telling you that things aren't what you feel and you need to update your beliefs about how the world works and how you work. So we think that's enough for a book. And so we think we succeeded that, but we do have some words about the topic of what to do. It just may not be enough for you. Yeah. So well, first of all, there's the que- yeah, okay, go ahead. first of all, there's a question of whether we're doing you a favor by telling you this stuff right at the beginning. Yeah. The idea is humans evolved and your ancestors evolved to turn a blind eye to this stuff. Evolution decided that for its purposes, you were better off not knowing. So if evolution was still right today about its purposes equating your purposes and this being the best strategy, then we are doing you a disfavor by telling you about this. We're, we're making you see something maybe you can't unsee so well. Yeah. Now, fortunately, most people are able to take a podcast or book like this. And if it's not what they want to see, look the other way and forget about it quickly. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. that's probably an option for you. But, you know, the first question to ask is, well, how could we be doing you any sort of favor here? So we'd say, well, it might be that, you know, evolution's purpose for you doesn't equal your purpose for yourself or that the environment has changed. So in particular, you might be, say, nerdy like me. <laughs> who doesn't have the right intuitions about self-repeat. We nerdy people don't just sail smoothly through the social world. We yeah. come somewhat clumsily through it. And so consciously thinking about things can often help us in ways that is less useful for other people because our intuitions are just bad. You might be a salesperson or manager for whom you know, being able to read other people's motives is especially important to doing your job well. And so you might be willing to pay the price of making it a little harder to self-deceive to learn about these things. Or you might be a policymaker or social scientist whose job it is to describe the world and what's going on. You know, this is pretty central to your job. If you are getting people's motives wrong, you're just going to be completely misjudging whole areas of the world that may be the specialty that you're focused on. That may be your thing. If you study medicine, for example, and medical behavior, and you assume people are going in to get healthy, then you're just wrong right from the get-go. So, you know, it's important for you to figure this stuff out. You know, I, I had a personal experience with this and, 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 and I, and I will say I'm, I consider myself to be a nerd. I'm sure you consider yourself to be a quote nerd. And I, and I agree with you, Robin, to, to a great extent, having learned about all this stuff, I, I can tell you, I'm not sure it's made my life. I, I know it hasn't made my life any easier. And in many ways it's made my life harder because like you said, once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. You literally see it everywhere. When I say it, I'm talking about hidden motives, hidden biases, things like that. So I'm not. I'm not sure it's made my. I think it has made my life more difficult. But you know, I, my personal belief is I'd rather know the truth than be deceived, even if the truth is a little bit pain. Right. Now, Let unfortunately, that might be another topic you'd be self-deceived on, right? For sure, <laughs> so yeah. This, be- it- this belief that we want to know the truth, I'm not so sure it's always true. I think yeah. one of the things you learn when you confront the truth is that maybe you weren't that interest- as interested in the truth as you thought. 
Exactly. Especially if the truth doesn't get you what you want. Like uh, oftentimes the truth will push you away from what you want. But let me ask you, let me ask you this question, because I've seen this, especially uh, during the pandemic, everybody's become an epidemiologist and an immunologist. Everybody's an expert on this stuff. Now we, what I've seen a lot on social media is people talking about, well, this model or that model turned out not to be exactly right. So why are we trusting science to do all this stuff? And I, and I want to bang my head against the wall when I hear that, because in my mind, that's exactly what science is supposed to do. Science is supposed to falsify hypotheses. Science is not physics. Science is not uh, math. Science is not chemistry. Science is a way of thinking. And so the idea behind science, or one of the ideas behind the scientific way of thinking, I think, is to check these biases. But maybe the scientists are deceived about that too, right? I mean, square one is to say, if we want to reason about something, we have to at least entertain two possible theories of the world. Right. So in this context, let's identify two possible theories. One is that these epidemiologists, et cetera, are doing a good job of having reasonable guesses and then updating them in the context of learning more. That's one theory about them and who they are and what they're doing. Another theory about who they are and what they're doing is that they take on the the image and prestige of science, but they aren't actually doing a good job of science. They are basically parroting whatever somebody wants them to say or whatever elites around them are saying and whatever seems politically, you know, in their interest to say. And they are just using the appearance and format and style of scientific reasoning without actually using what you might say is the key process of being careful and honest about the uh, their what, you know, deciding if their theories are correct or incorrect and updating them. So those are the two theories on the table, right? Right. And so now when we see them out there, okay, they have a theory and it didn't do so well. The key thing we have to ask is under which theory was that more likely? And that's the Bayesian way to do Bayesian reasoning to try to slightly move in the direction of one or the other. And I got to say that particular data point doesn't really tell you much about either of those directions. Merely the fact that some of their models weren't so good is consistent with both of these stories. So if you want to draw a conclusion about one story or the other, you're going to have to do it on some other evidence than the mere fact that sometimes the models were a bit off. If you say the models have consistently been way off, okay, that's more consistent with the story that they're bullshitting and don't know what they're doing and they're just spitting out you know, things that look nice that don't make sense. Yeah. On the other hand, if you say, well, look, a lot of the things they predicted, they got it right. And they were those things were kind of surprising. So I'm impressed. Well, that supports the other theory that says, well, looks like they know some stuff and they're telling you some stuff that you can't expect them to get it all right. But I, you know, the key point here is for most people, you're not going to know enough to distinguish between these two theories merely on the basis of that. Sometimes they got some things wrong. I and mean, come on, that's just going to be true no matter what. This is a perfect segue, I think, into talking about something that I, you've been interested in. We were talking about it right before the show. You've been interested in this recently. The difference between expertise, experts, and elites. Talk about, talk about that a little bit, Robin, if you don't mind, because I, I think this is a really fascinating topic. Well, I just like looked up a couple Google pages where I, you know, expert elites, I put on the top, and basically a number of pages conflate them. Most of the times when people make the two concepts, they say they're basically the same. Yeah. They use them interchangeably and they're not interchangeable. So let me give you some of the distinctions where, where the, it makes a difference. So for example, there's a difference between a newspaper reporter and an op-ed or column. Yes. Uh, the reporter is more an, an expert mo- an expert, and the op-ed is more of an elite. Or think about the difference between boards of directors and boards of advisors. <laughs> advisors are the experts. The directors are the elites. Yeah. Or think about on a conference, the difference between a talk and a panel. In the t- talk, you're in an expert mode and you are speaking as an expert. In the panel, you are supposed to sort of be an elite. You are, um, you know, you're going to open up to questions that you hadn't thought about ahead of time that maybe you haven't done research on. You're still going to opine about them and you're still going to talk about them as if you were an elite. And if you think about like most, e- even a Nobel Prize winner, What's the first thing most Nobel Prize winners do? Well, they try to make a bid to be an elite. They've just reached the peak of expertness and they've decided this gives them an entree maybe to become an elite. So they start to write op-eds and they start to express opinions on a wider range of topics because they think maybe now they can be treated as an elite. Uh, 
Now, in mo most firms, the structure is that employees at the bottom are in a sense the experts. They know the most about each part of the job. And the manager at the top is the least expert on any particular job, but they are the elite. They make the key decisions. Now, the managers will usually, if you have a decision the company makes and somebody challenges the company about it, the, the manager or their PR person will usually point to the experts and say, hey, I've got all these good employees and I just do what they tell me. Yeah. And so, you, you, but of course, the manager really is making decisions, but they'd rather hide behind the expertise of their employees. And even when you think about promotion, usually the story is going to be, well, we're going to take people who are the best at their jobs and promote them because promotion goes by expertise. But of course, we know that in fact, promotion often goes by eliteness. Yeah. And so, an eliteness is more your general, you know, suitability for being a general all around respected person. How good you are at the water, how good you are at the water cooler. Oh, basically. right. Yeah. Uh, for example, right. There's a whole bunch of complicated things going into choosing elites, but basically they are two different games played by different rules that overlap. And so one of the more interesting things is elites often try to hide the elite game they play and pretend to be experts or pretend to be something else. Yeah. And, uh, but often, you know, in some sense, the, the Nobel Prize winner shows you that in fact, the elite game is the game most people would like to join if they could. <laughs> Even Nobel Prize winners say, too bad, I'm only an expert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not an elite because I want to go try to be one of these elites. And uh, so the, the, the biggest claim to say is that in society in general, we're following the same pattern. So if you look at like government agencies or newspaper, news media or something, almost all the major institutions in our society present themselves as if they were trying to follow the experts. Yeah. Newspaper reporters just trying to interview the experts, the government agencies trying to hire the experts and do what they decide, right? All these institutions are basically presenting themselves as if, if we have elites, it's only that these are people who have, or are experts and that's what makes them the lead. And they're denying that there's any difference between elites and experts. They're, it's all the same thing you see from the image they present. Yeah. Now, if we realize, no, 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 elites are a different group of people than experts and they are, have a different process and a different game, then we see that in fact, in our world, it's elites who make the key decisions, not experts. Yeah. And I think this was dramatically shown early in the pandemic. This is what really highlighted it for me, made me think about it over the last you know, nine months. Pandemic experts have had their standard story about what to do in a pandemic that goes back decades. And you know, you can look at all their standard writings about you know what to do about travel bans or what to do about masks or what to do about quarantines and all those sorts of things. And they've had their standard story about what to do in a pandemic. And there was no particularly new information that showed up, except as soon as we had a pandemic, all the experts, all the elites in the world suddenly decided that's a subject to talk about. Yeah, yeah. The elites went wild talking to each other about pandemics and the elites decided that they did want masks and they did want quarantines and lockdowns and they did want travel bans. And yeah. so the elites declared that was the better thing and they, the experts caved immediately. Yeah. As soon as the elites declared that that was better, the experts changed their mind about what the expert judgment was. Just like in 1984, of course, I was just reading this section last night where in the middle of a speech, they declare that no longer at war with Eurasia and now at war with East now, Asia. Well, well, yeah, now at war with the other ones, yeah. And the narrative completely. Right, and, and there, and there, right, but the, no, yeah. the speaker didn't even acknowledge that the change had happened mid-sentence. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, similarly in the pandemic, you know, people didn't really acknowledge that suddenly all these pandemic efforts had caved and changed their minds entirely about what to do. Yeah. And this shows that fundamentally, you know, it's also sort of a feature of politics and many other things. When the elites don't care about a topic, the experts rule. Yeah. The experts do their expert things and they decide. But as soon as elites turn their attention to a topic and talk about it and come to some sort of elite consensus, then the elites rule. That's the decision of what happens. So I've been thinking about this and tell me if this is kind of similar to what you're talking about. I've been thinking about this for a year or so. And here's 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 what it is. So you you hear, for instance, like LeBron James starts opining on certain political issues and he's told just go dribble the ball or Kim Kardashian is yeah. talking about criminal justice reform or you see you listen to Rush Limbaugh yeah. or whoever you want to talk about on cable news is offering all these opinions about things that they demonstrably know almost nothing 
about? Like, so in other words, why, right. why sure. would anybody listen to Rush Limbaugh about right. that's like any asking, topic at all that he has no You're expertise. asking why are there elites at all? And so that's why, that's yeah, that, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. It seems to me like, Robin, what you're saying is we don't really care that much about expertise, or we, at least we don't care as much about expertise as we pretend we do. Right. So what we fundamentally care about is status and affiliation with status. So yeah. humans, like many other animals, have status hierarchy, and we are really eager to be seen as high a status as we can. And so eliteness is about this prestige and status. Yeah. There's a lot of things that go into being considered a prestige, prestigious person, but you know, having elite education or having elite credentials of an academic or having a TV show or being, you know, in, in the news a lot, those are all things that add to your eliteness. And so we're lo mostly looking at people's overall status when we judge how high an elite are they. And then what happens is elites talk among each other, they gossip. Yeah. And that gossip forms an opinion that's a strong anchor for everybody else. We want to agree with the elites. We want to follow the elites. And in fact, you know, there's many studies that suggest elite opinion drives most policy in most countries. Yeah, uh, it's not popular opinion that drives policy. It's elite opinion, and it's the opinion that the elites form by talking among themselves. That is the thing that you know the actual policy follows. So we are each mainly interested in showing that we are a good candidate for elitehood. <laughs> that is, yeah. we should be considered high status. And one way to do that is to agree with the elites and to try to share as many features as we can with them and to try to associate with them. And that's the game that humans have played for a very long time. And we continue to play, but it's a complicated game because not only are we just trying to show that we're smart or pretty or rich or whatever else goes into that, but the elites have all these coalition dynamics among them. So one side of the elites is going to try to knock out another side of the elites and make some more room for people like themselves. So that happens politically, for example, where you know one you know left elites try to knock out and cancel the right elites so that all the elites are left. Or for example, elites who are academics will try to get rid of non-academic elites. Yeah. You know, et cetera. And so basically there's all these different factions among the elites who are vying for positions, but fundamentally they, they want to disagree somewhat to knock down the other time. But they if there's any strong consensus among the elites, they want to seem like they're agreeing with that. Yeah. So and maybe a, an example in my own personal life would be, you know, I, I profess to be very interested in logic and reason and science and stuff like that. But maybe part of that is because the people that I want to impress, i.e. the Robin Hansons of the world, the Ben Hunts of the world, the Robert Wrights of the world, they're interested in that too, right? And so I'm basically speaking the same language that my peer group and the people that I want to impress speak. So the, the, the most obvious thing to notice is take any group of experts, I don't know, chemists, when yeah. they get together, they try to switch into elite mode. Yeah. They try to be like they were a panel at a conference. They talk about things way outside their area of expertise. They try to talk about them smartly and, and with the agreement with others, but they're trying to convince the people around them, hey, I am elite candidate. I'm, I'm elite material here. Yeah. You should think of me not just as a chemist, but as a potential elite. And it's clearly, you know, elites very rarely try to convince you they're good chemists. Yeah. <laughs> so you very rarely, so, so for example, say a reporter makes a book on a subject I don't know, it might be about COVID or something. Well, if they write this book, they will interview many experts on COVID and then their book will have some expertise on COVID. And then they might give a talk and somebody might ask them questions about COVID. And in that quick Q&A, they will kind of pretend to be an expert. If, they, if the question is a question they know the answer to because they wrote this book, they will be happy to tell that. But they're not that eager to be seen as an expert because, hey, they're the journalists who wrote this book everybody likes. <laughs> It's much more that the experts are eager to be seen as elites than the elites are eager to be seen as experts. Except yeah. that in some sense, the elites all want to pretend that they're expert enough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whatever it is. Talk about, you mentioned something earlier, because I think this is very germane to, uh, again, the times we live in now. You talked about how to deal with disagreement or how, how to disagree. Talk about that a little bit, if you don't mind, Robin. It's a very tough subject. Uh, it's a subject I spent a lot of years researching. And so... The key point is that it's in fact not reasonable to, dis to knowingly disagree. Interesting. That is- um, I disagree we, with that. No, I'm just yes, kidding. We, we, do <laughs> we do disagree a lot, but yeah, no, there's this just... literature on what a rational creature would do in the context of disagreement. And consistently what rational creatures do is not disagree. Yeah. They 
try hard not to disagree. They, they tr basically, the main reason they don't disagree is they take what other people say very seriously as a lot of evidence. Yeah. They are persuaded by what other people say to a great degree, more than we are. So we are insufficiently persuaded by what other people say. We discount what they say relative to what we thought a moment before. And so that's fundamentally on average, the reason why we disagree. And so that, you know, if you want to be more accurate in your beliefs, the most simple thing to do is just, you know, be more reluctant to disagree, be more persuaded by what people around you say. Now, in a world where people disagree, of course, you can't agree with all of them yeah. because they say different things. And so you are somewhat forced to make choices, although you could try to sit in the middle. Uh, but of course, the key thing to realize is you have incentives to disagree. That's the reason you were built to disagree. So if you seem to be too agreeable, then people think first you're low status and second you're stupid. Yeah. Because maybe the stupid low status people would be submissive and you know let other people push them around in terms of opinions, but the you know high status dominant smart people will less often listen to other people and more often you know go with their own thoughts. So we are in some sense more eager to show that we are you know, dominant or at least not submissive and that we're smart and that we're creative and that we are thoughtful than we are to, to be right. So that you can know about yourself. And now the question is, well, what are you going to do about that exactly? Um, so uh, it seems to me like one thing some people do is they try, as you mentioned before, to have a long list of biases and to learn them and to try to check everything they say against their list of biases to try to fix them against the biases. Yeah, I think that works a bit, but not a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I, I agree with you on that. Your subconscious is just too good at fooling you. Yeah, I, I, I'll give I'll give you I'll give you a good example of that. Okay, so and one of the reasons I think that people have such a hard time when people challenge their beliefs is because we build up these identities, egos, whatever you want to call them, and people feel often as if when you're challenging somebody's idea about something, you're you're literally challenging their identity and that that that's that that's harmful right but i'll give you a good example of this so my dad uh voted for trump two times he's a conservative republican he's a great great guy I just released a podcast with him as a matter of fact and when we talk about politics i i will literally before i call my dad i'll tell myself don't sit there and preach and argue just ask questions and what do I do two minutes into the conversation? <laughs> I start telling my dad why he's wrong about everything, right? Yeah, like yeah. I, I can't, can't help help myself. Yeah. So, but, but okay, what so you're how, saying what, is, I, you, I do have a fix. It's yeah. not a great, it's, you might not like it, but I have a fix. Yeah. Instead of collecting lists of, of, disagree, of topics of, of, of biases or just making a note to yourself to disagree less, here's the fix. <clears throat> Change your incentives. Nice. So, for example, one way to change your incentives about almost any topic is to make a bet about it. As soon as someone says to you, after something you said, do you want to bet, your mental process immediately switches. Yeah. You suddenly, the, well, the moment you said it, it sounded clear and clean and believable and obvious even. And as soon as someone says, want to bet, you immediately start to wonder how you could be wrong. How exactly. the words you use might be ambiguous. Yeah. And how bad it would look if you did go through this bet and it turned out you were wrong. <laughs> yeah. Do you really want to take that chance? That's what happens the moment you start to think about betting on something. And so a habit of betting on things and being in an environment where people challenge other people to bet or you even challenge other people to bet will change your incentives yeah. to be more honest. And similarly, you know, in, a, in an environment where there are experts on something and you express an opinion, if the experts are the sort who are liable to like call you on it, if you're wrong, you you will suddenly get a little more cautious about what you say. Yeah, you, you know, you're, you're right about that. Although I've experienced, I, I've had a couple experiences like, so the other day I was posted something on Facebook about a legal issue. And every single non-lawyer non on my comment thread was, was offering all these, you know, amazingly complicated legal arguments. And, you know, near the end of the thread, I I mentioned these people. I said, you know, I've been a practicing board certified lawyer for over 20 years. Right. It, it, it's almost like people, it, it's almost like they, they they don't care. They just don't, they have their own opinions so, and they don't care if they're talking. Yeah, to so so one interesting thing I, I've seen, I don't know what these people are, your friends, but let's test the theory. When people are in a cocked, you know, party conversation or something, there's different kind of experts. A lot depends on the relative status of the kinds of experts. 
So for example, if there's a, a physicist and a lawyer, at least in many contexts, the physicist won't mind expressing opinions on law. But the lawyer <laughs> will be pretty cautious about expressing opinions on physics. Yeah. It's not about that the lawyer actually knows less about physics than the physicist knows about law. It's just physics is higher status. Yeah. And so in some sense, higher status people are allowed to opine on other topics more and get away with it uh, because that goes along with their status. For sure. Here's another uh, here's another idea I want to uh, run by you about how to deal with disagreement. And, and before I run this by, I got, I got to tell you, I'm not very good at it. But I'll, so I'll ask you a question. Uh, did you watch the football game last night, the national championship? Nope, I did not. Okay. Uh, but you thought about that for a second, didn't you, when I asked you that question? I, I wanted to make sure I understood you enough to yeah. answer the question. So briefly, very briefly, I just took control of your mind by asking you a question. I, sure. I led you in a direction that I wanted you to go. And so yes. may, maybe one way to deal with disagreements, and again, I'm really bad at this. I'm, I'm trying to get better. But rather than tell people what I think and what they should think and this argument or that argument, just ask better questions. Or make statements that are harder, that are less disagreeable. So, for example, a standard advice in an interpersonal conversation where people are tempted to be sensitive is to keep saying, I feel. Yeah, yeah. Because your feelings about something is something less likely they're going to disagree with. You know, if they said you neglected me, yeah, uh, then they are going to disagree with that. If you say I feel neglected, then you know they they can more accept that. Well, though. why do you feel neglected? You shouldn't feel that way, right? Well, yeah, but the, the point is, yes. Yeah, so, so make weaker statements is a, is one thing. Um, yep. So, so another thing. So I probably the you know the biggest podcast I ever did, a little bigger than yours. Sorry, is That's Sam okay. Harris. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Love Sam Harris. Love Sam. Harris. Okay, and you know a thing that came up that a lot of audience members liked, which is a common thing, is just, I said just have fewer opinions on topics. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need as many opinions as you usually have. This exactly. Is a, that is, you should pick the topics on which you're going to be somewhat expert and you're going to invest in those and you're going to tell people what you know there. And on other topics, you don't necessarily need opinions. You can just go with what other people say and that can be okay. Have fewer opinions. And in each topic, ask yourself, do I need an opinion on this? Am I, you know, especially good at this? And if yeah. you don't need an opinion or you don't have any special expertise compared to other people you could rely on, then don't have an opinion on it. Yeah. That's a that way to disagree less is just have fewer opinions. Certainly fewer poorly thought out opinions, poorly considered reasons, all the more reason to get rid of those. There's another, I think this is Shane Parrish from the Knowledge Project. I think I got this from Shane, but one, one of my favorite sayings kind of along the lines of what you're talking about is, I have strong opinions loosely held. Like I, I have some strong opinions about things, but when presented with evidence to the contrary, I'm willing to abandon those. And, you know, I tell people right. one of my favorite things in the world is finding out that I was wrong about something because when I find right. out I was wrong about something, I can correct and get closer to the truth. Of course, uh, you know, this gets back to what we've been talking about basically the entire podcast. I'm probably to some extent deceiving myself by thinking. So the, the problem is that you can say that you're going to hold the opinions loosely and that you're going to allow yourself to change your mind easily. But how yeah. do you actually do that? Where What yeah. knob do you turn in your head for that? And yeah. I think the knob of not having an opinion on the subject is a little easier to check. For sure. For sure. And well, Robin, we, we've been going for a, a little bit over an hour now. There's a couple more things that I wanted to cover. Do you have a okay. few more minutes or so? Sure. Okay. We were talking before the podcast. I feel like I really want to talk. So you are, you've been into uh, cryonics. Basically you signed yeah. up to have your brain frozen when you reached out there. You're, you're pulling out your, uh, what is that? Your chronic Medical tag? alert tag. Yeah. Nice. Tell nice. Them somebody should uh, call them up if there's a need. So, so talk to us. You're going to have your brain frozen when you die. I think Ted Williams did the same thing, by the way. So yeah, and, uh, right. along with a lot of other people. So talk to us about. Not a lot, actually. Not very many at all. Really? That's okay. the surprising thing. So, 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 so talk to know, us the, about that. Yeah. So the, the key idea is that when current medical science gives up on you, we can let worms eat you or we can freeze you in the hope that future medical technology will be able to revive you. Now, we're not talking future in five years. We're talking 50 or 100 years later. Yeah. That might not happen, but, you know, the continued growth of the world economy and technology suggests that it's a good bet. Um, the more likely failure is that somehow your frozen brain won't be preserved until that future date when you could be revived, perhaps, and fixed. 
Um, I have this book called The Age of M, Work, Love and Life and Robots Rule the Earth. And it's a, you know, a scenario about brain emulations and you'd have a shot at becoming a brain emulation in that future world if you are cryogenically frozen. Yeah. It's not gonna be easy to unfreeze you and it may be in fact turning you into brain emulation is the main thing that would be possible later. But the key point is it costs a modest amount of money <laughs> And uh, it gives you this chance of, of a future revival. Now, there's a other thing you can do that costs about the same thing that about the same number of people do, which is to have your ashes thrown into space. <laughs> and we all know that that's not going to bring you back. <laughs> right. And some people do that. It's kind of weird. And their spouses are okay with it. It's kind of quirky, but okay. But a lot of people's spouses really hate cryonics. And that's kind of interesting because, again, it costs about the same amount of money, about the same number of people do it, and it, you know, has very little chance of working. So apparently what people bothers people about cryonics is the thought that you think it might work. Yeah. <laughs> Either that or maybe your spouse doesn't want you to come back. <laughs> Well, I think it's sort of a betrayal and abandonment thing. You're willing to come back without them is yeah. the story. And you know, in some sense, that's not true for the ashes into space. But, you know, that's an interesting fact about human behavior. So the most striking thing about cryonics is if you do surveys, large fractions of people think, yeah, that kind of makes sense. If you look at the actual number of people who've done it, it's say, even the number of people who signed up for it is less than 3,000. And the number of people really? it's ever been done to is less than 300. Really? So, wow. That and it's gotten free national, international publicity for 50 years. So yeah. something is really big as a difference between the number of people who say they'd be willing to do it or the number of people who actually do it. There's this enormous chasm there. Two, two books I want to recommend to you, one of which the title is not coming to my mind right now, but, but both uh, approaching this from a kind of a scientific perspective and more of a philosophical perspective. So are you a Neil Stevenson fan? He's a science fiction writer. Sure. Okay, he wrote. I've a, read many long ago, but I read many of his books. Yes. All right, he's got a book that he wrote uh, pretty recently, and when I say that, I think within the last two years, and it's called Fall. I think it's called Fall or Dodge in Hell, and it's about exactly. I've read that one. Yes, I read so, that. So, so isn't that an interesting scientific exploration of kind of what you're talking about? Like, what happens? Could you upload consciousness into a computer? So there was then, also a, a recent yeah. TV show uh, that came out on Netflix, I think, or Amazon called uh, Uploads. Yeah. And so it had a similar theme to that book, which is it focused on if you, you know, could come back and have your brain be emulated, it would be like a heaven or hell. Yeah. And so the usual story framing is that this is sort of a replacement for a religious heaven or hell. It's a way to sort of actually make a heaven or hell for people's brains. And I think that just misses the main thing, which is this isn't a heaven or hell, it's a real world. And so for example, in the book, in the, in the TV show uploads, they make it a rule that you're not allowed to work in this world. So you have to pay for it ahead of time and then it's luxury all the way afterwards. But of course, in reality, I think what happens is that they work and this becomes the wor the main world where people do things and work. It's not a side heaven or hell, it's, it's the new world. Yeah. There's another book by, I think it's a, he's a Dutch uh, philosopher. I'll, I'll, I'll find the book and I'll send you an email about it. But basically the idea behind this book from a philosophical standpoint is death, the ceasing of life is what, is what gives meaning to everything. And without death, there's essentially no meaning for, there's no reason to do anything. Like in other words, if we were immortal, we would have no motivation to do anything like being immortal would be terrible. And that's the basic so, I mean, philosophical argument on that. Th there isn't any realistic chance of eliminating death. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about the rate yeah. of death. Yeah. So obviously, you know, there are mayflies who last a month and they die quickly. We aren't mayflies. Would our life be more valuable as mayflies? I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, we live a long time relative to mayflies, but a short time compared to cosmology. Yeah. So even if we lived a million years, we would still die and life can still have meaning because there's an eventual death. So I, I, it seems to me if you, if you, I don't want to argue about whether death gives meaning to life because there really is no prospect of not having death. The, the lack of death scenario is just not a scenario that can work. Uh, it's just all about how long is plausible to go before you die. Do you have any thoughts about, because I think this is a, to me, this is the most important question uh, in science right now. Do you have any 
thoughts about consciousness and, and in particular hard problem consciousness. In other words, let's say you're frozen. I, I, I do, let, but I'm going to disappoint yeah. you. <laughs> so I, I, I'm a pretty hardcore physics person. And so yeah. you know, I'm just going to take the standard physics story pretty literally and yeah. be done with it, basically, you know. Clearly, physical stuff is capable of consciousness because we are physical stuff and we're conscious. Yeah. So QED, if we rearrange our physical stuff or make new physical stuff, that stuff could be conscious too because it's more physical stuff. There is no other extra thing. That you would be the key point. There is just physical stuff, which obviously can be conscious. And that's all there is to say. There is nothing more to say. There's never going to be anything we will learn more than that. We, we will never know anything else. We will just know that there is physical things and some of them claim to feel to be conscious and that's it. Do you think there's anything special about the biology of the human brain as it relates to consciousness? Or do you think that if we had the right information and the right processors and put them in the right order, that uh, consciousness could arise outside the context of the human brain? So of course it could. So yeah. the, the thing that's di distinctive about the human brain compared to other sorts of computer organizations is that we have this a PR person, as we talked about earlier, yeah. we go to the trouble to have a central narrative about what we're doing and why. Yeah. Now, you, you know, there are many computer systems in the world that don't bother with that. They just do stuff and they don't construct a central narrative of what they're doing and why. We construct that central narrative. So that's the place from which we describe our consciousness is that central narrative. And that's, we organize our discussions of consciousness around that narrative because that's a narrative we have in our heads. If you were a creature without that narrative, then if you're gonna be conscious, it would have to be in some other way than yeah. having that central narrative be conscious. So that's the main thing that's different about our brains is they are organized around this PR person with a central story of what they've been doing. But any other computer program that also organized itself around such a central narrative could certainly also be conscious in the same way that it remembers being conscious. It tells you it's conscious. It tells you it's important for it to be conscious. It tells you why it wants to be conscious. It tells you it remembers being conscious, et cetera. Do you have any, have you thought about, or do you have any ideas about the point of consciousness, like the evolutionary point? Like, like it, it seems to me like evolutionarily consciousness is a bad thing in many ways, right? No, it, it's, it's tied into the central narrative again. So, so many other animals. Well, why do we, why do we do need it? Why, why do we need a central narrative? Like what, what, what's the point of that? So that's Evolution. what we talked about before. We have norms. Norms are expressed in terms of motives. We need a story about our motives to defend ourselves from accusations of norm violations. So that's yeah. the point. The point is to tell our story in terms of the motives we want to tell about why we did things, which hopefully protect us from accusations that we broke rules. But a zebra doesn't need that. A zebra doesn't need to explain why right. he ran away from the lion. Why do, we exactly. need to, why do we need to have this narrator? What's the point of the narrator? So that's the key point again. We have norms. Yeah. Zebras don't have the norms. So we have rules that we've worked out among ourselves about what we're supposed to do and not supposed to do. And we enforce those norms by watching what each other are doing. And if we see a norm violation, calling attention to it and having a discussion about what to do. That's the distinctive human strategy, social strategy. Because we have that social strategy, then we need uh, to protect ourselves against the accusations by having this narrative. And therefore, that's why we have consciousness in the PR agent who is ready to defend ourselves there. Nice. Last topic. We got to talk about this. Aliens. You, you, you <laughs> we don't have much time here. <laughs> I, I know. I, I know we don't have a lot of time, but you, have, you, you do have some ideas about aliens. And also, I don't know if the great filter... It's in here perfect. It does. It does fit, actually. Does it? Okay. So talk about but briefly, it. First of all, I have to do it very briefly. Yeah. So, tell people real quick what the great filter is and what your mm -hmm. ideas about aliens are. All right. So once upon a time, the entire universe was dead. Then each little part slowly evolved over time, moving through levels of evolution, becoming simple life and then more complicated life, then intelligence, then civilization. And then eventually we might become a spacefaring civilization that spreads out in the universe. My, uh, the great filter is about that whole process and how hard it is. And so it seems pretty obvious that, that whole process is in general hard. So if we say on a planet like Earth, what's the chance that something could go from the beginning to the end of that process in only 4 billion years that we've seen so far, you have to say, well, that's pretty unlikely. On most planets, it doesn't happen. It happens every once in a while somewhere. 
So the great filter is how hard that is and like whether there are more steps ahead of us, because if so, then we're not gonna, probably not gonna make it. And we can think of that filter not only per planet, we can think about it per galaxy even, that you know, what's the chance that eventually a galaxy will give rise to an advanced civilization that would spread out. And the universe has basically been going through this process in each galaxy, in each place, slowly having a chance to maybe advance to the next step. And eventually it produces civilizations, which you might call aliens, except here. <laughs> and the question is, well, how many of them are there and where are they and at what level are they? So I wanna make a key distinction between quiet aliens who don't expand very far, don't last very long, don't do very much, and loud aliens, which are big and do a lot. And so in particular, I want to define grabby aliens. So grabby aliens are aliens who, as soon as they can, expand as fast as they can. And wherever they go, whatever they control, they prevent other grabby aliens from showing up there and, and doing the same. If this is what happens in the universe, then eventually the universe is full of grabby aliens and no new grabby aliens can show up. And this is what I offer as an explanation for why we seem to be early in the history of the universe. This great filter process rewards things happening at some random time in the universe, not just then, but farther into the future so that this process can have achieved its end. So the chance per time actually goes as a power law, which really pushes toward later times. So we're really early compared to this distribution. So if if we didn't exist, would there be another alien around here eventually in this part of the universe? If the answer is no, then we're really rare and we should have appeared at some random time. But if there would be likely to be other aliens around if we weren't here, then eventually they're gonna fill it up and eventually there'll be a deadline by after which we couldn't appear. And that's why we're as early as we are. So that's our explanation for as early. But, and so in this model of gravity aliens, actually we say roughly 40% of the universe out there at this moment is full controlled by gravity aliens a lot. And if we can see them in the sky, they'd be huge. And the reason we don't see them here is there's a selection effect because they expand at nearly the speed of light, that is almost all of our entire past volume, our past light cone is excluded because if they had appeared there, then they would have shown up here and prevented us from existing. <laughs> and that's why we don't see them in this past light cone. And that's why the universe looks so empty, but it's not. This this reminds me of uh, Fermi's paradox. That is what, that, that's what this brings to mind. Well, so, so it's the same subject, yes. Why yeah, don't we see anything? Why, why, yeah, why, why do we not see aliens? It could be either because there are no aliens or because they haven't contacted us or because we're not sophisticated enough to receive the signals or something like that. Well, that, that would work for the quiet ones. Well, what about the really big loud ones? Yeah, right. So exactly. in our analysis, if there was an alien civilization in the sky, it would be much bigger than the full moon. It would be huge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so you really couldn't miss it, but we don't see it. And so the selection effect is our story that uh, the reason we don't see it is that if it was there, we wouldn't be here. Yeah, we'd only really see things that are just at the edge of visibility, and that's not very, you know, that's a rare thing. And so the point is, most of the universe right now is full of alien, these aliens taken over. Within a billion years, they will get here. Yeah. And then you know we will have contact, but we, so we've got maybe 100 million to a billion years left before we make contact. So it's not an urgent thing, but they're out there, and we will see them. They're coming. Well, what a great way to end the podcast, Rob. And I, we, we went a little bit longer over our time. I really, really appreciate all of this. Uh, you, you're, you're a really, really bright guy with a lot of really good things to say. Tell everybody before I let you go, if they're interested in learning more about you, your writing and things like that, where they can find you online. Well, I'm uh, hanson.gmu.edu, um, also robinhanson.com. I'm on Twitter at, at Robin Hanson. I have a blog called Overcoming Bias, but just Google my name and you'll probably find what you want. Nice. Well, Robin, have a great day. And again, thank you so much. This was a beautifully intellectual conversation. I really liked it a lot. We could have talked for three hours, but maybe but anyway, we will someday. Not maybe today. we will. Thank you very much, Robin. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye.